Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. Protesters in Ferguson are not backing down their call for justice for unarmed teenager Michael Brown. Based on a preliminary autopsy, Brown was shot six times by police officer Darren Wilson, and protesters are demanding that the police officer be arrested. Overnight on Tuesday, police arrested 47 people, but clashes were noticeably calmer. Now protesters are also calling for the county's prosecutor to recuse himself. Now joining us to get into some of these issues is our guest, Reverend Osejifo Seku. He is a native of St. Louis, Missouri, and a Freeman Fellow with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. He joins us now from Ferguson, Missouri. Thanks for being with us, Reverend. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be with you, dear sister. So, Reverend, before we get into the news of the day, I think it's really important for our viewers to understand the situation before Michael Brown's murder. What are the issues that plague the community of Ferguson? Well, I think uh, when we look at Ferguson, I'm, uh, this kind of small piece of land, about 21,000 citizens with a uh, medium income of $36,000, but one in four folks living uh, below the poverty line. But when you look at the difference between the $14,000 difference between the, the, the one in four who are living in poverty and the other three of uh, 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 three uh, in four folks who are at $36,000, they're still working poor people. Uh, um, and that combined with the high levels of police repression experienced by black young black folks in that city. Uh, and then when you look at larger uh, St. Louis County, some a few years ago, uh, 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 Prosecutor McCullough refused to bring in an indictment uh, for police who shot uh, into a car some 20 times, killing uh, two uh, uh, black men uh, who were unarmed. And the, these kind of stories of repression and harassment and taunting for the police are, are, are legion in the experience of young black people, combined with St. Louis County and St. Louis City proper, writ large are highly segregated spaces uh, in which the lines of demarcation are clear and so, and then when you look at the electoral level, some 67% uh, of African Americans in the city of Ferguson yet uh, little to no representation at the electoral level. And so these are apartheid-like uh, 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 statistics that speak to the kind of existential apartheid and existential angst. And, the hell that everyday people are catching, many of whom are struggling to make a dollar out of 15 cents. So if I'm understanding you correctly, this is people who are basically on the brink. So, so we shouldn't necessarily be surprised by what we're seeing unfold there in Ferguson. No, 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 not at all. In fact, we should, the nation should be celebrating the fact that we've had such low levels of violence in places like Ferguson and the Fergusons throughout the country because these young people uh, without very much hope and without very much options and without very much opportunity. I was speaking with a school teacher in the Ferguson Florence School District uh, the other day and she was saying that it amazed her that all of this money for tanks and tear gas, yet she had to write a grant to get iPads for her students and, uh, and had to personally buy dictionaries uh, for her students. And so the kind of economic uh, disproportionate crisis in terms of the way in which people are experiencing uh, deprivation uh, should all bring us to our knees. Uh, uh, I think the numbers are in 2013, some 450 Fifty million dollars have been provided to municipalities vis-a-vis uh, -vis in kind contributions from the Pentagon, combined with other resources expend, uh, spent for the militarization of police. Yet teachers have to buy, spend their own money to buy dictionaries, and so that is a metaphor for our situation. That the dictionary, the language, the discourse of democracy is so impoverished. Uh, that perhaps the only word that we should be using in the lexicon of American democracy is shame. All right, let's fast forward to today because right now protesters are still in the streets demanding justice for Michael Brown. And his mother was on ABC News on August 18th explaining what would bring about peace. Let's take a listen. How can peace be restored, ma'am? Mm -hmm. With justice. 
And what is justice to you? I'm being fair. Arresting this man and making him accountable for his actions. So, Reverend, you just heard um, Michael Brown's mother saying arresting the man and making his the, his actions accountable, making him accountable for his actions. So can you just describe for us, since you're there on the ground, what are the protesters' short-term goals? Well, let me first just acknowledge the dignity of Sister uh, Max Patton, that in the midst of, and when you think about her and the dignity of Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's mother, and the dignity of Mamie Teal, Emmett Teal's mother, we ought to stand up every time they we say their names because the level of dignity that these women have displayed shames a nation uh, and bears witness uh, to a kind of uh, elo what Cornell West calls the eloquence of black silence that their mere being should shift us all and ought to make us uh, want to be better human beings. In fact, uh, I think there should be a national requirement that every time you say uh, Leslie makes, uh, makes bad and you ought to have to stand up, you know. And then I think the demands is her demand, right? It's a demand that says that first, uh, uh, it seems the case that neither the governor, uh, Jay Nixon, nor uh, uh, Prosecutor McCullen are going to uh, uh, call for a local special prosecutor uh, and that they will, uh, he is, and McCullen is not going to, uh, uh, McCullough is not going to step down. So there is an indictment that uh, 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 a, a grand jury that has been assembled. And so uh, folks are local folks are calling for an expedited uh, indictment that brings back an, in, uh, an expedited grand jury that will bring an indictment to him. Uh, and then after that indictment, uh, uh, so the charge, uh, we need him to be convicted. And uh, if that, convic uh, that conviction will bring some sense of solace, uh, with his arrest and uh, ultimate conviction. He needs to be uh, off the street, not being paid uh, uh, in, his, uh, in, uh, in his flagrant violation of uh, uh, Michael Brown's civil rights, as well as his abuse of his police power uh, and his ultimately taking the life of this precious young person. But Reverend, as you mentioned, there are some real systemic issues there in Ferguson and all over the country. What are some long-term goals that you think the community could really focus on? And what specific policies do you think would really help deal with these issues of poverty and racism that you mentioned earlier? So I think uh, it seems the case that the people of Sir, uh, Ferguson in their right to self-determination have uh, uh, have been quickened uh, by all of this. And that quickening will, I think, lead to a greater engagement with electoral, poli electoral politics. I mean, part and parcel of, uh, you know, many have trotted out, I think it's some 12 to 15 percent of uh, Fergusonians uh, voted in the last uh, election. And, and the challenge with that uh, uh, is that low voter turnout is not a sim is not is not the problem. It is a symptom of a broader sense of disenfranchisement when there is a uh, uh, sixty percent, sixty seven percent African Americans in the city uh, and some fifty three police officers, and I like three of them are African American. Right, that that's a broader systematic form of disenfranchisement, and that this systematic dance disenfranchisement means that that people don't have a vested interest. Uh, and in the system in which it's supposed to represent them. And so I do believe that, that we'll see an emerging slate of African-Americans who are going to be greater engaged into uh, the political process. I, I, and, and so I think, at the, so that is at one level. I think at a broader level, right, in terms of federally, like unemployment in Ferguson has doubled between 2000 and 2012, right? And so real, like, real challenges of economic opportunity and economic deprivation is what we're facing in, in Ferguson, but also all over the United States. And so what can do is that at the federal level, there needs to be, in, and, and, and this is me not speaking for the people of Ferguson or me speaking for the local organizers, such as the Organization of Black Struggle and other folks on the ground here, uh, 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 but it is to say 
that there needs to be a federal work program uh, at the level of the WPA and, and doing the New Deal that creates economic opportunity and folks are having access to jobs uh, and decent and living wages. There needs to be a greater investment in education, as I mentioned earlier, whereby teachers do not have the opportunity. Somebody should do the math, right? Of if you look at the $450 million that has been spent on the militarization of uh, local municipal policing forces, if you do, how much would that take to buy? How many books could you buy with 40 million, 450 million dollars, right? And so I think these broader systematic issues. I know there is some conversation among the National Action uh, Network as well as John Conyers uh, is calling for a hearing to do some form of what. Uh, uh, the great Anna Julia Cooper talked about of anti-lynching, anti-police brutality legislation that never took hold in the United States. And so uh, I believe those might be ways in which at the federal level, uh, as well as the local engagement with electoral politics, that might be able to stem the tide and put out the raging fires that are at work in Ferguson, which is a microcosm of the greater United States. I'm glad you mentioned the federal government because Attorney General Eric Holder is supposed to be in Ferguson on Wednesday evening. Do you think Attorney General Holder could actually do something positive? Can he do anything to really benefit the community? Well, there is some 40 FBI agents on the ground uh, engaging uh, in interviewing people around the case. It, it is reminiscent of me of Freedom Summer uh, with the murder of uh, the three civil rights workers uh, and that project there. Um, and so federal agents are on the ground. Uh, at the federal level, it seems the case that this needs to be, uh, it, the prosecutor just simply cannot be trusted and the police simply cannot be trusted based on their behavior, which I have not read about, not simply what I've read about, I've experienced. I've been here for five days. I came in Friday night. Uh, and um, I've been here for five days. Uh, I've, every night I've been on the street, uh, I've been tear gassed uh, for in, uh, as a, with others, right? Uh, in standing with, in solidarity with these young people who are engaging in a rich tradition of civil disobedience and non-compliance. In fact, black youth, these black working class and black poor youth have seeded a revolution in America. We are having this conversation because of these young people and they should be celebrated, not call agitators and looters and rioters, but these are, uh, these are young people who are sowing the seeds of a new revolution in America and we should be thanking them and not demonizing them. And so the, 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 the Holder could provide uh, at some level uh, the, somebody needs to check the Ferguson police and the uh, St. Louis County police. My experience on the street, the majority of the arrests have been unnecessary. And in instances where young people are throwing water bottles, plastic water bottles that are being thrown at the police, and the instances in which people have set things on fire and have looted, two things have happened. When you've trapped them, police on one end of the street, um, and blocking them in, they can't go anywhere, right? When you've trapped them, you have not given them any other options. When you refuse to allow them to engage in their First Amendment rights. So you've created the context. The second piece is that in many of these instances when there have been looting, mostly young black men have gone and stood in front of the stores and refused to allow people to loot those stores. That story has not been told. I saw it for myself. It has been these young people who have often protected journalism, journalists from the police and provided milk for their eyes. Like when the McDonald's was broken into, it wasn't just broken into and looting. It wasn't like people were going in to cook burgers and to drop fries. They went in to get milk to give to people who had been tear gassed. And that story has not been told. And so Holder could play a role in ensuring the rights of these young people to engage in assembly to bear witness to and to stop. In fact, the existence of Holder and the existence of Barack Obama is predicated on the activities of these young black people engaging in civil disobedience and holding the space for a black president or a black attorney general. 
All right, Reverend Seku, we want to hear more of those stories in the future, so I hope you'll join us in the future. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, dear sister, and uh, blessings to all of you all. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.